This is Primal Quest Essentials. It is a rules light fantastic Stone Age role-playing game. I came across it when looking for games of a truly open license. And I can happily say that Primal Quest has a great truly open license. You can make material compatible with Primal Quest by adhering to the simple rules. You can use text directly from this document. Credit Diogo Noguera for being the original creator of Primal Quest and include link to both this document and this. And that's it. The game has a number of inspirations and the one I found obvious is Gendy Tartakovsky's Primo from 2019. If you haven't watched that, I can highly recommend you watch it. That series, in turn, has been inspired by Spie and Feng by Robert E. Howard and, of course, other Stone Age stories. But Primal Quest has a number of inspirations and, as I said, there is no th such thing as true originality. Inspiration doesn't just come out of a void. So this is like the Appendix N of this game, but it's in the preface. This is all of the stuff that inspired the author and that might inspire you when you're writing adventures and characters for this game. The rules are fairly simple. For a check, you roll a number of positive dice and a number of negative dice. I suggest you roll different colored dice for this. Then you take the highest positive die and the highest negative die and subtract the highest negative die from the highest positive die. This will give you a result between minus five and five. But by rolling several dice, this creates a bell curve around the number zero, meaning that to set the difficulty for any check, you can just start with zero as standard, one or two is hard, three to four is very hard, five is daunting and six plus is legendary. The difference that you get from the die result minus the difficulty is called the effect and that is important. For example, if you attack someone, the effect is added to your damage. You can have extra positive dice, so you're rolling a larger pool. These are mostly circumstantial bonus die you will get, but you can also invoke a tag similar to the fate system. So. So every character will have attack, every piece of gear, every environment and opponent. Same thing, you can get extra negative die. If the text, if the situation is against you, you get extra negative die. And then you just roll a larger die pool. When one of your positive die shows a natural six, you score one boon. That can be spent to generate benefits. For example, you can apply the appropriate stat again to a test result. You can give a positive die to another character's next test, which is a nice team building exercise, I think. Negative die to the opponent's next test, gain inside some other benefit. Similar story for negative die. When your negative dice comes up with a natural six, you gain one setback. If you really want to succeed at a check, you can sacrifice hit points, and this is called effort, to gain extra positive die. So it's not all circumstances and luck. It is also how much you're willing to sacrifice on this one check. Character creation is fairly simple. You assign three points among body, mind and heart. And you may reduce one to minus one to increase another by plus one and no attribute may start higher than plus three. Next, you create five tags similar to a fate system that define your character. What is your character's concept? Like, is he a warrior, shaman or law keeper? Talent, something that sets the character apart that only they can do. Keen eye, sharp reflexes, eidetic memory. Motivation. What drives the character forward? Honor, duty, riches, power, salvation, peace. Relationship. 
What's a close relationship the character has? Family, friends, comrades, trouble. What makes the character's lives harder? Do they walk with a limp? Do they have an enemy? But all of these texts go back to extra positive and extra negative die that can be gained when these texts are invoked. So you can invoke your concept and your talent or your relationship to gain extra positive die. But the GM might invoke something like your trouble to give you negative die. But it's all good because in the experience system back here, you get an extra XP for the use of a tag for the first time in a session. So no matter if the use of the tag is positive or negative for you, you get extra experience points. So that should motivate everyone to get good use out of their tags and play their character. Then you choose an equipment pack, A, B or C. A is warrior, B is hunter, C is spellcaster. And that will determine your rough role in the group. Other stats, vitality, hit points equal to 10 plus body. Defense is a bonus when you're rolling on defense and it's determined by armor and shield. And then details like name, gender, looks and personality. Advancement, you gain experience point, survive the gaming session using tags, make an impactful mark on the gaming world. These can be spent for improvement. So this is a classless and levelless system. And you can spend this to increase your attributes or to acquire new tags or to change tags. And since your attributes and your tags is everything that makes up your character, that's all you need. Under equipment, we find resources. Since this is a stone age world, currency is almost non-existent. And your main form of barter will be clean water and food. Humans need one unit of food and one unit of water per day to survive. And we've got some usable encumbrance rules. We've got short equipment table here, just four kinds of weapons, unarmed, small, medium and large with costs and damage. Costs are in units of resources, of course. How much food do you have to trade for a large weapon? And we've got Armor, light, medium, heavy. This gives you a defense bonus. And also a drawback like encumbrance, two encumbrance, three sizes of shields. Shields can only block a few attacks before they break. Equipment breaking is a major point of this system. So shields will break after one to three blocks and you won't have the defensive bonus anymore. But everything else also breaks. We have these durability rules. When you use an item or a weapon and a setback is rolled, so naturally six on a negative die, it can be spent to damage said object. When the durability reaches zero, it's broken. Fairly simple. And we've got different material that weapons and objects can be made of. Wood, bone, stone and bronze which also gives me some insight in the setting. So this is Stone Age and Early Bronze Age. And the smithing of iron has not yet been invented. But the most common materials, wood and bone, can only be damaged once. Stone can only be damaged twice and even bronze can only be damaged thrice. So weapons, tools and armor will break fairly often and then you have to pick something up from a fallen enemy or comrade fashing something else or barter for something new combat rules builds on all of this in a round of combat you get two actions per round and these actions include movement attacking and defending so for your action economy, it becomes important if you are moving, if you are defending, and if you are not, you can attack twice. The initiative rules are very simple, defined by the referee in accordance with the fiction. When in doubt, characters need to make a body test and they will act before any opponent whose level is equivalent or lower than the result. 
healing might sound familiar we've got short rest long rest and extended rest resting allows you to roll dice to regain hit points regain vitality points interesting to note while your body attribute decides how many vitality points your character has to regain them you need your heart attribute your willpower long rest and extended rest also enables you to recover from adverse effects such as poison illness and other maladies but there are no rules for poison illness and other maladies in this rule set so i would rule that uh, poison or malady gives you a negative die when using a certain attribute until you have recovered from it and that way you could suffer from three conditions at once one for each attribute dying this game is fairly forgiving when it comes to dying when a character's vitality reaches zero they fall unconscious and will wake up in one hour if it drops below zero they must test body if they succeed they fall unconscious and will wake up in an hour if they fail they are injured and will die in one hour if not healed so no matter what happens your character doesn't die outright and your party has one hour to trial and heal him sorcery this is a free magic system meaning that within the magic words of your arcane focus an object of power that the runes for the word of power are carved into within these magic words within these categories you can cast whatever spell you want so if you have got a magic rune of fire you can cast firebolt fireball firewall walk through fire summon fire elemental and whatever else fire elemental magic you can think of and we've got a good selection of words here and i'm sure your spellcasters and your gm can think of more we've got wolf for example so you could summon the endurance of a wolf control wolves summon a pack transform into a wolf outright and so on so your creativity is your limit so after describing the effect of the spell what you want to do within your arcane focus the referee determines if it is cantrip invocation ritual or miracle depending on how big the effect is that you want to achieve the caster or any willing or helpless target they touch can spend vitality to add positive die to the test so for a big difficult spell you can summon your acolytes to help you cast it and give you a huge number of positive die or you have a good old-fashioned human sacrifice then you make a mind test against the appropriate difficulty and if successful the spell works as intended it is a failure no effect and any vitality points spent are lost so the so any spell you cast is categorized in one of these four depending on how powerful it is cantrip most narrative effects that don't cause direct mechanical impact in the game such as producing a small flame changing hair color making something briefly disappear invocation something that can be reproduced by an individual with appropriate equipment so firing magical arrow climbing a smooth wall that could be done with a bow and arrow or that could be done with a rope ritual something that would require a group of individuals to recreate so bashing a castle gate open building temporary shelter shooting a fireball from a catapult but well, you don't need a catapult you have a ritual casting time 10 minutes so this is something you would do outside of combat to solve a certain problem miracle these are truly extraordinary effects that cannot be reproduced without magic or advanced technology like becoming invisible causing an earthquake making a meteor fall from the sky 
So a miracle is something that an entire plot would revolve around. Either getting the required resources to do and perform the miracle or to stop someone else from performing a miracle. This test is pretty much impossible. And a miracle can realistically only be performed by the most powerful spellcasters with a big sacrifice or half a dozen acolytes that add vitality and positive die to make up for all the negativity you get. And even then, there's a good chance you won't succeed on your first try. Running the game. Fairly short jamming section, but what is here is good advice. Present a dangerous world full of possibilities and threats. Remember to be the character's senses. Describe not only sight and sound, but smells, tastes, sensations, texture and touch. Telegraph danger before it strikes the characters. Death always leaves trail. Always present multiple choices for the players and be open to new possible solutions as the players will certainly find them. Show the consequences of their actions for the better or worse. The game world is alive and reacts to the characters. Always be fair. You're not playing against the characters, but you're not playing to help them either. You're a referee, a neutral arbiter. Let the dice fall where they may. Reward good ideas and determination. Not everything will work all the time, but don't be stingy when the characters risk too much. At least let them try and make sure they know the risks. Some rules to run tests and here random encounters. Every 30 minutes of game time roll 1d6. On one an encounter occurs. Roll another d6 on how rare it is. On a two an omen of an encounter occurs. So you see something that you might have encountered. I think every 30 minutes of game time is way too much. Maybe when you're out exploring in a dungeon. But for general overland travel, that is 48 rolls for an encounter per day. And since we've got these exploration rules here, we know that we can travel one hex in six hours. So that would be 12 rolls for one random encounter per hex traveled. I think that is a bit much. But that's, that's the thing. You can change it around if you want to. I would probably only roll once every six hours of game time and 30 minutes or even 15 minutes when they're exploring a dungeon room by room. Anyway, your opponents only have four stats, the level, that is the difficulty for anything you try against the opponent. Though I personally would give special opponents more than just a level. Give them like three stats so the players can decide not to confront them against their strongest stat but work around that and find out their weaknesses. And they have the damage value, same as a weapon. This is added to the effect of an attack to calculate the damage. Vitality, same as a character. And special abilities. There are no hard and fast rules for them, so this could be anything. Spell casting, special effects, siege, damage, ability to fly, whatever your opponent requires. Some rules for reaction, getting lost, camping, and this completes the rules. Now there's not a lot of rules. This is very basic, but I think by using tags, not only the characters tags, but also for NPCs and situations, using positive and negative die to modify the pools, these rules are very flexible. And if you keep the attitude of rulings instead of rules in mind, and apply all of these rules flexible and make up rulings on the spot, this should be enough to run a Stone Age game. There's no monster manual in here, but since this is a fantastical Stone Age setting, your monster manual becomes a 
book about Stone Age megafauna and you will have smilodons and mastodons and mammoth riding barbarians. Also, every dinosaur you can think of, get a book about dinosaurs, that becomes your monster manual. There will be at least four human species living in parallel. Homo sapiens, Homo neanderthalis, and two others I can't name from the top of my head. And it should be fairly easy to give tags and assign levels and damage to all of these creatures. We've got a short hex crawl after the rules. It's an introductionary adventure, the mother's whale, with its own table of random encounters. And this is also the monsters you can encounter in here. So there's an hour ox, but down here is also a triceratops, which is level five, does five damage and has 20 vitality. So this is a very dangerous opponent indeed. Number of hexes in here that you can explore all with their random encounters. So there's enough stuff to explore for two or maybe three gaming sessions. There's not a lot of additional material for the game out yet, but they are running a blog with a fan sign for the primal world of Teia. And there's already one adventure that has come out. I will leave a link to both the core rules that are pay what you want on drive through RPG and the adventure in the description down below. So primal quest essentials. It is as the name says. This is just the essentials. The bare bone framework of an RPG. And I think this requires an experienced GM who knows how to run RPGs in general to make use of it. But then you get a flexible and easy to learn framework to run fantastical Stone Age adventures with. And since this is truly open license, Anyone can contribute, write their own adventure, publish their own adventures for profit, built on these rules. This is a neat little game. And since it is pay what you want on drive through RPG, I suggest you check it out. There is no printed version yet. They are planning to release one through Exalted Funeral, but this document doesn't even have 30 pages, so it's very easy to print out and staple bind yourself, which I have done. And I made a video showing how this is done. I'll leave a link up here if you're interested in that. That's all I've got for today. Thanks for watching and goodbye.